Can I ask you a quick, do you, do you need this? Uh, no. No? Okay. I'm fine. I'm fine. I'm so used to this. <laughs> I am so used to this. <laughs> Some places you go, there's a lot of deals, a lot of places. It kind of depends what they're doing as well, where they are in the semester.
Good evening. Good evening, everyone. It's such a delight to be with you here on a, uh, on a Tuesday evening, um, interrupting a frantic now rush towards the end of the semester. Uh, you've all made a very, very good decision about how to spend the next hour and a half. So um, uh, I'm, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Nicholas Demancho, uh, head of the Department of Architecture here at MIT. Um, and it's my privilege to welcome you to the 29th annual Pietro Belushi lecture presented by Leslie Loco. I'm going to give my uh, colleague uh, and Dean Hashim Sarkis the privilege of introducing Leslie, but I'll give you a little bit of background on the Belushi lecture first. <clears throat> and before that, I'd like to begin with a land acknowledgement, acknowledging also all the complexities of that um, proposition. MIT acknowledges indigenous people as the traditional stewards of the land and the enduring relationship that exists between them and their traditional territories. The land on which we sit tonight is the traditional unceded territory of the Wampanoag Nation. We acknowledge the painful history of genocide and forced occupation of their territory, and we honor and respect the many diverse indigenous people connected to this land on which we gather from time immemorial. Particularly, um, for those of you who may, uh, for whom the memory of Pietro Belushi may have faded into history, let me, um, I will briefly describe uh, the person in whose honor we are also indirectly here tonight. Pietro Belushi was the dean of the MIT School of Architecture and Planning from 1951 all the way to 1965. Born in Ancona in 1899, Belushi was educated in civil engineering at the University of Rome and Cornell University. He made his first career in the office of A.E. Doyle in Portland, Oregon, uh, a firm under which uh, he became chief designer and brought under his own name, um, uh, building the Portland Museum of Art and the Equitable Museum uh, uh, building in Portland, um, and uh, equally known for numerous houses and churches of incredible design and fine craftsmanship, making Belushi a leader in the regional tradition of the Pacific Northwest. After, however, William W. Worcester, um, uh, left the deanship at MIT in order, I might say, to take on an influential deanship at Berkeley, uh, Belushi was invited um, uh, uh, to become dean here and in a convocation speech at Reed, Ar Reed College in Oregon, anticipated his new work in a way that recalls the challenges of practice and teaching today. In these dark times, where, <coughs> uh, sorry, Belushi said, we have a greater need of faith in the future than ever. By the symptoms of current events, our civilization may commit suicide on a tremendous scale and in a shatteringly short amount of time. But I persist in the optimistic view that in all events, the foundations of a new renaissance are being laid. It will not be for us to see it, and we must reckon in generations for its flowering, but I believe a better environment for a happier mankind is in the making. It is a task to excite the imag imagination, and it is now in the hands of our young people, which, as I look out of this lecture hall, is now actually you. So um, with that, uh, um, uh, oh, he, the, with that, I will, uh, uh, that was, uh, uh, conclude my remarks and just say that that was why Belushi came here to teach. That's why he gave most of his career to education versus practice. Um, and I think uh, in that incredible tradition, um, uh, we have tonight's Belushi lecturer, Leslie Loco. So um, I will let Dean Sarkis introduce her to you. Um, and I thank only um, Yolan Daniels and the Lectures and Exhibitions Committee, Joel Carella, um, as well, for making this evening happen. Good evening all, good evening, Leslie. Uh, forgive the many presentations. It's a sign of our excitement that you're here. Nicholas, thank you very much for the honor to introduce tonight's Belusky lecture, Leslie Loco. Leslie is the founder and director of the African Futures Institute in Accra, Ghana. She holds bachelor's, master's, and PhD in architecture from 
the Bartlett School of Architecture, University College in London. Leslie was also the founder and director of the Graduate School of Architecture at the University of Johannesburg, and then the Dean of Architecture at the Bernard and Anne Spitzer School of Architecture. She is author of many publications and novels, and is also the editor of White Papers, Black Marks, Race, Culture, and Architecture, and the editor-in-chief of the journal Folio, a journal of contemporary African architecture. Leslie is currently a visiting professor at the Bartlett School of Architecture, University College, Dublin, and has held visiting professorships at several universities, like the Cooper Union, University of Virginia, and others. Uh, Leslie was appointed curator of the 18th International Architecture Biennale in Venice, which opened in May 2023. In January 2023, she was awarded an Order of the British Empire for services to architecture and education in King Charles New Year Honours List. And in the same month, she was awarded the UK's highest architecture award, the Reba Royal Gold Medal. And a double reverence from both kingdom and empire. <laughs> I first met Leslie Loco over the phone in 2019. I had heard a lot about her and read some of her work, not the novels, and I wanted to invite her to join the jury of the Venice Biennale of 2021, which I was curating under the title, How Will We Live Together? In my mind, I had formed a good jury consisting of people I knew well, Kazuo Sejima, Sandra Barkley, Luca Molinari, and Lamia Jurej, and I thought that they complemented each other in terms of what they brought to the table. But I really wanted someone else to bring something unexpected to the mix, and importantly, someone I did not know personally. When I shared all of that with Leslie over the phone, she was quiet, and then she responded, oh, so you want a wild card? I gladly accept. I was, you remember. <laughs> I was clearly pleased, but I hope you understand I was a little bit nervous. A wild card. <laughs> a pandemic and the year went by, but in the summer of 2021, when she did take part in the jury deliberations in August of that year, her mark was immediately felt in the way that the awards were chosen to reflect a search for architectural futures, emphasizing the youthfulness of the participants and elevating the architecture of the world's margins, bringing it to the center. Past Biennales had often been about Europe showcasing its architecture to the world. In the jury selections, Leslie's wild card was firmly played, even if with a soft hand, and the awards came to celebrate Africa, the Middle East, and the margins of Europe. It was no surprise that her presence and voice caught the attention of the Biennale director, Roberto Cicuto, who invited her to curate the 2023 Biennale. In that role, Leslie delivered on another sense of the word wildcard, meaning be careful what you wish for. Her Biennale, titled The Laboratory of the Future, gave a soft but powerful blow to the establishment of what does it mean to exhibit architecture revealing how an exhibition could be a laboratory, how architecture could boldly imagine the future and how all along Africa has always been that radical future that architecture and the world aspire for. Leslie also, also showed how we can be critical of the colonizations and carbonizations embedded in architecture while still being deeply committed to the aesthetic and social project that is architecture. The positive feedback to the laboratory of the future proved also that there was such a thing as a welcome disruption. The reviews, which usually expect architectural exhibitions to be plans, sections, and elevations, were generally really glowing. And what was there not to like? An exhibition that was softly but firmly curated and narrated, accessibly presented to broader audiences, unfolding examples of an engaged and engaging architecture with a strong commitment to identity and difference, celebrating but not essentializing. 
It was the art of seduction at its best, killing us softly with her show, to paraphrase from Roberta Flack. In my humble opinion, this was the best architecture biennale ever, reshuffling the deck, changing the rules of the game. So for all of the above, please join me in welcoming to MIT the wild card herself, Leslie Lu. Thank you, Hashim. I have uh, you to thank for <laughs> the wild card of Venice. So um, good evening, everyone, and thank you for coming this evening. It's a pleasure to be here at MIT, and I'd like to thank Yolanda Daniels, Dean Sarkis, and Joel Carrera for making this possible. I've been back and forth to Boston a few times over the past couple of years. I'm beginning to know my way around the airport, but this is my first time to MIT. So thank you again for the invitation. For those of you who've heard me speak before or seen lectures on YouTube, you'll already know that I favor, or I generally favor, a more elliptical approach to lectures preferring to see them as a form of oral storytelling rather than a didactic opportunity. The older I get, the less sure I am of my ability to teach anyone anything, at least not directly. And more and more, I see my role in the classroom as the person who puts the platform in place rather than the person who instructs or imparts. A rich, imaginative and provocative platform that gives students the confidence and self-belief to take risks and explore the as yet unknown seems to be an ambition worth fighting for. A few months ago, unable to sleep, I clicked on a random Instagram account called at female boss mindset. I now get witty, occasionally inspirational sayings at all hours of the night and day, and some of them are spookily accurate. The title of tonight's talk is soft, although it doesn't refer to refer to fluffy dogs, furry Uggs, or soft scoop ice cream. In the murky arena of international politics, the term soft power is often referred to the ability to co-opt rather than coerce, to shape preferences and outcomes through appeal and attraction, not through force. In 2020, the media company Monocle combined a range of statistical metrics to measure the soft power of 26 countries using approximately 50 factors, including the number of language schools, Olympic medals, the quality of architecture, and business brands. I was so intrigued by this metric that I paid 120 pounds on the spot to subscribe to Monocle. It's fascinating reading, sitting somewhere between pop psychology, marketing, and critical theory, which initially seemed to be strange bedfellows but put me in mind of something I'd seen almost two decades earlier. Around 2003 or 2004, a couple of years after 9-11, I watched a three-part documentary by the British filmmaker Adam Curtis called The Century of the Self. Like most of Curtis's films, it requires multiple viewings as the material is dense and sometimes difficult to follow. What was most interesting about it, at least for me, was the threading together of psychology and sociology, looking at the nature of power and how we experience power at both the individual and the mass, the collective or mass level. I had never heard of the so-called father of public relations, which we often confuse with the, the word press, as in press and PR. The original meaning or its etymology really is to do with how we interact with one another publicly rather than privately. A new theory about human nature was put forward by Sigmund Freud. He had discovered, he said, primitive sexual and aggressive forces hidden deep inside the minds of all human beings. Forces which, if not controlled, led individuals and societies to chaos and destruction. This series is about how those in power have used Freud's theories to try and control the dangerous crowd in an age of mass democracy. At the heart of the story is not just Sigmund Freud, but other members of the Freud family. When we're home, this episode is about Freud's American nephew, Edward Bernays. 
Bernays is almost completely unknown today, but his influence on the 20th century was nearly as great as his uncle's. Because Bernays was the first person to take Freud's ideas about human beings and use them to manipulate the masses. He showed American corporations for the first time how they could make people want things they didn't need by linking mass-produced goods to their unconscious desires. Out of this would come a new political idea of how to control the masses. By satisfying people's inner selfish desires, one made them happy and thus docile. It was the start of the all-consuming self which has come to dominate our world today. When I was preparing this lecture, I thought many times about what it was like as a student 30 years ago, trying to navigate my way through a canon that seemed, at the time, indifferent to the context I had come from and unwilling to open itself to examination. I look back now at my first public lectures and their titles, Calm My Blood, An Architecture of Absence, Argument from Silence, When is a Door Not a Door, and I now realize that I was simply looking for a way in, for a door to open or a path to open and reveal itself. What I didn't realize then is that there was no door, at least not in an obvious sense. That door, that opening into the discipline from its outermost reaches, would have to be made, is still being made and remade every day, every month, every year. This lecture is therefore offered in the spirit of opening, some wide, some barely there, all of which can be characterized, I think, by an approach to power that recognizes the different and complex negotiations with power that also have to be made again and again in different contexts, times, places, and spaces. Softness has served me well, I would say, as have a handful of other words. I should also say that I turned 60 last Friday, and although I've been saying I'm 60 for the past few years, unlike many people, I couldn't wait to be 60, going into this last decade, if I'm lucky, of my working life is quite momentous, although not quite in the way I expected. And to explain that properly, I'm going to move sideways to an event that took place in Munich almost 20 years ago. It was a two-day conference or symposium, I don't really remember, and the list of speakers was long. Towards the end of the first day, an Austrian architect, Alexander Hagner, gave his talk. I don't recall the details, but it was about a building in Vienna that brought together three very different user groups, students, refugees, and the homeless. I recall being very struck by his description of the three groups, students usually understood at being as being at the beginning of their adult lives, refugees often caught in the middle of their lives, and the homeless generally seen as being at the end of life's productive end, at least in the capitalist sense of production. I don't view myself as being at the end of my productive life, but I am very much aware of how past decisions and actions impact current and future plans, and that's a very different space from which to operate and move. It manifests in the way I think, write, make, and talk, and tonight's talk is no exception, and it especially manifests in the way I move between thoughts and things, experience and expertise, fact and fiction, although the last category is becoming increasingly blur blurred. In 1989, as a first year student at the Bartlett, I asked one of my professors if it might be all right if I did something about black culture. He took his pipe out of his mouth long enough to say, black culture? That'll take you about 10 minutes. What are you going to do then? I froze. He smiled. And then he reached behind him and plucked a journal from his shelves. I think it's fair to say that third text changed my life. Nearly 30 years later, that same professor met me in Rotterdam. We had a conversation about that conversation and laughed over a bottle of wine. He asked if I still had the copy of third text. I said I did. When he passed away a few months later, he left his entire library to me, and that library is now at the Graduate School of Architecture in Johannesburg. Third text was a paradigm shift. It jolted me out of my solipsistic existence as a first-year student, 
under the illusion that my interest in questions of race and identity were mine alone. An entire world of scholarship and inquiry came crashing through the walls of my mind and the Bartlett, leaving us both reeling. I have to say that my undergraduate years were very difficult. The curriculum was not designed to grapple with questions of identity, race, or gender. It wasn't designed to deal with difference. Words like post-colonial had been around for decades in literary theory and cultural studies, but not in architecture. My first public lecture was held in all places at the Prince of Wales's Institute for Architecture in 1995. I think the title of the talk was Race and Space, but I can't be sure. All I remember of the event was being incredibly nervous and of being stopped halfway through by someone walking in and switching on the lights. I remember the person distinctly. He was dressed in plus fours. It's a kind of tweed British hunting outfit with a cravat and a, and a, a flat tweed cap. I no longer remember his name. All I do remember is hearing afterwards that he was the first black person to graduate from Oxford University with a PhD in musicology. His name might have been Ian Hall, but it's 30 years ago. He walked to the front of the lecture hall and began a conversation in, with me in public with the lights on. Young lady, he said, I've listened to you go on about race and architecture for 20 minutes now. All very interesting, I'm sure. But I'd like to ask you something else. Do you know what the origins of opera are? Uh, no, I said. Well, I'll tell you. Opera emerged in the 17th century as a way of bringing together several disciplines, painting, poetry, drama, dance, and music. But it was actually based on a much older art form. After the fall of ancient Greece, only fragments survived. A few descriptions here and there in poems, on tablets, in friezes. During the Renaissance, these were pieced together to bring what we now understand as opera to life. My question to you is this. You've been going on about the fact that you're convinced that there's a relationship between race and architecture, but are you prepared to accept that if you do bring those two terms together to fashion something new, what you might get may be neither? Of all the things I didn't expect to learn whilst curating the Venice Biennale, or I suppose any exhibition, is that exhibitions are the fault line where public and private meet. During the two-year-long build-up to the opening of the exhibition, I wrote several letters to the dispersed and often fragmented members of my team. Over the past few weeks, I've read them and reread them, looking at them through the lens and benefit of hindsight. The truth is that there is never any preparation for curating something like the Venice Biennale, even for those who curate professionally for a living. This was my very first letter, and in some ways, it's also the last. And if you'll bear with me, I'm going to read the first paragraph. Dear colleagues, it begins. There are many ways to start a creative project. Sometimes it begins with an idea, a kernel of truth that the author or curator hatches in the wee hours of the morning when the rest of the world is asleep and the mind wanders fluidly, easily. The idea grows, acquiring depth and weight until it is formed enough to be shared. At other times, an idea or concept appears fully formed, usually born out of the conversations that preceded it. Occasionally, however, it is not ignited by a single spark, but is rather the crystallization of many ideas whose provenance can be traced back years, sometimes decades. This letter, essay, email, book, pamphlet, is addressed to all of you who make up the African Futures Institute and the Biennale Project. It is available in both print and digital form. It is akin to a manifesto, but it's written in a different key. It has many chapters, and each chapter is accompanied by a text or video that you are asked to read or watch. Think of it as a love letter, a passionate description of the task that lies ahead. It is both personal and public. It was written in one place, in one go, but I have been writing this all my life.
should also say that Dean Sarkis's was the most visited. as black people excluded from the education system for such a long time. This is a special moment for me, as I symbolically assume the vice chancellorship of Wits University. The big universities, the ones with brand value, the ones where the elite used to go, increased their fees by double digits. The logical thing to do. Were we going to accept the increase or were we going to fight? And we were clear that we were going to fight. You want a more just society, you want a dignified society, and you want a deep commodified university. And that is why we are fighting for free education. And if we leave here without doing that, we would have failed as big students. The Fees Must Fall movement came about organically. It belongs to everyone and no one at the same time. It just felt like a disgust and disappointment with a government who would shoot its own children. We knew that this is actually a game to break us. They said I gave breath to the struggle. In some senses, they're right. I did. No one can stop an idea whose time has come. Two student-led protest movements in South Africa in 2015 and 2016 rocked the country. I founded the Graduate School of Architecture at the University of Johannesburg in 2016 on the back of an existing master's program. I think it's safe to say that if the protests had not happened, the school would not exist. The confrontations that followed the violence opened up a space for a different kind of pedagogy, one that was not actually new, in fact it was based on an older model that had been radical in its own time and place, but it is now firmly established, at least in the UK. The Graduate School of Architecture had two aims, to transform the way we teach architecture and to change what we teach. Although it was a full decade before Black Lives Matter and the introduction of decolonization as a term in mainstream academia, it was remarkably prescient in what it sought to uncover and rebuild. Whilst the terms decolonization, transformation, and curriculum have become key buzzwords, the definition of what it means to decolonize or transform a curriculum remains a gray area. There is no clarity about whose responsibility it is to undertake this process. The educational experience implies more than the topics covered in any given course. It encompasses the attitudes, values, dispositions, and worldviews that are learned, unlearned, relearned, reformed, deconstructed, and reconstructed whilst undertaking a degree. Curriculum is both content and praxis. In other words, focusing not on individuals or the group in isolation, but rather through exploring how both individuals and groups create understandings and practices. We argue that it is vital for all participants, staff and students, to agree that history has robbed so many societies of ideas, skills, creativity, originality, talent, and knowledge. And part of the difficult and challenging process of transformation acknowledges this loss. It also involves conscious, deliberate, and diligent interest by both black and white academics in indigenous knowledge systems, cultures, people, and languages. 
Universities need to keep encouraging critique and problematization of what is considered to be knowledge and the processes involved in generating it. And a decolonized curriculum, importantly, needs to exist in dialogue and contestation with other worlds. It cannot be seen to be everything about all things at once. And the decolonization of buildings, of public spaces, is not a frivolous issue, and it is inseparable from the democratization of access. As Ashil Mbembe, the Cameroonian scholar, has said, when we say access, we are also talking about the creation of those conditions that will allow black staff and students to say of the university, this is my home. I am not an outsider here. I do not have to beg or apologize to be here. I belong. Such a right to belong, such a rightful sense of ownership, has nothing to do with charity or hospitality. It has nothing to do with the liberal notion of tolerance. And it has nothing to do with me having to assimilate into a culture that is not mine as a precondition of my participating in the public life of the institution. Rather, it has to do with ownership of a space that is public, common, good. It has to do with an expansive sense of citizenship that is itself indispensable for the project of democracy, which means nothing without a deep commitment to some idea of publicness. To achieve this, a new set of pedagogies must be conceived of, a set of creative practices that make it impossible for official structures to ignore or marginalize. We call these transformative pedagogies, and protecting the space in which such ped pedagogies may develop and mature is the fundamental and main priority of any university interested in the question of decolonization. Decolonization is the meeting of two forces, opposed to each other by their very nature. Their first encounter was marked by violence, and their existence together, that is to say the exploitation of the native by the settler, was carried on by the impact of a great array of bayonets and cannons. In decolonization, there is therefore the need of a complete calling into question of the colonial situation. If we wish to describe it precisely, we might find it in the well-known words, the last shall be first and the first last. Decolonization is the putting into practice of this sentence. That is why, at a descriptive level, all decolonization is successful. The naked truth of decolonization evokes for us the searing bullets and blood-stained knives which emanate from it. For if the last shall be first, this will only come to pass after a murderous and decisive struggle between the two protagonists. That affirmed intention to place the last at the head of things can only triumph if we use all means to turn the scale, including, of course, that of violence. When I first began teaching in the United States in the late 90s, it was the first time I'd ever heard the words design problem, at least in connection with architecture. I had never thought of a brief or a project as a problem, even though there are clearly challenges embedded within every design situation. But the word problem really threw me. It implied an answer, a singular answer, to something that is far more nuanced and complex than a problem. In the same way, as a student 30 years earlier, whenever I brought up the subject of race, tutors or colleagues would always assume that I was in search of a solution to racism, which has always been too, far too narrow an interpretation of the, re the rich, phenomenal space of creative inquiry that race throws up. The puppeteers string me up. My wrists hang limp in the air. I am everything they want me to be. To be a girl is to boil over and evaporate in the same breath. To love and be loved silently. To be a boy is to get my way. 
To be gendered is to answer every question before it is asked. To ask no questions. I follow my cues. I say all the right lines. The puppeteer speaks in my mouth, jerks open. I speak only when I am spoken for. Obedience is a safer body than mine. His movements are my movements. As if I were just an image in the mirror. And I let it happen. Gender is a puppet show. It's ventriloquism. Whatever it takes to fool you, there is no easy escape. Costumes letting my body escape me. But I am learning how to become. How to fight through dysphoria and disobey. To untangle this body from the girl I was once woven into. To unboy my joints from whittle blocks. I snapped the strings that have held me safe but sorry. They snap back and leave telemark bruises. One, for every time I let my femininity be replaced by whatever it is I've escaped to. Change is not easy. I wish my body didn't need a gender. I wish I didn't have to be a real boy or a real girl. I wish I didn't have to be real to be allowed to exist. How might one describe the problem here? The Zulu word for an architect, Nkambi Wesino, is a beautifully rich and complex phrase, meaning an alchemist or a magician of space, the maker of a situation, or the maker of a sensation. In Gugu's work, there are clearly multiple narratives, forms, materials, and uses at play. Is the problem one of finding voice? Finding the right space or form for that voice? Finding the right materials to give life to a situation? Finding the right platform or program? Is she, a young Zulu female architect, the problem? Or is it a curriculum that insists on a strict delineation between studio and seminar, between history and theory and design, between electives and core classes or credits and teaching hours, or the power imbalance between adjuncts and tenured faculty? Over the past decade of teaching on the African continent, understanding representation in all its diverse forms as a means of exploration, not explanation, offered African students, and here let me only speak about students, not practitioners or professionals, a way out. For me, it represents a real triumph of will, not only in the context of global speculation about architecture and architectural education, but particularly in the context of Africa, which has never deserved, in inverted commas, to be speculative. There are too many toilets to build, too many people to house, too much poverty and chaos and corruption, as if those things were uniquely African and too many problems to solve. But I have never held that view, not as a student, and I certainly don't now. There is a lot of work to be done to reconfigure a curriculum that better serves our needs, and I'm not talking about sanitation or social housing as important as they are, but rather that gap between exploration and explanation. And for me, the speculative space of the future begins with a new relationship to and with representation.
The film is by Samaya Valley, who I'm sure many of you um, here know. So my favorite expression over the past two years has been, next time I say I'm going to open a school of architecture, please shoot me. And I promise you it is only half said in jest. The African Futures Institute is an institution that is still very much in the making, still very much in progress, without any real template or precedent. It owes much to multiple small and often independent schools of architecture that have emerged over the past 50 years around the world, not so much in terms of its structure or curriculum or even its ambitions, but more in the idea of a radix, an experimental rhizome of ideas and perspectives brought together in a single place, the institution. Our big design project, and this is becoming clearer to me every day, isn't so much the design of a space, a building, a program, or even a school. It is much, much broader than that, and is therefore harder to describe. I don't mean to suggest that it's any bigger or better, just broader. This is um, one of the silos that was built by Kwame Nkrumah. This is the building from the 60s, which is lost in time. And then we are trying to excavate it in order to be able to produce new futures. We are trying to open up the discourse in terms of art. How do we go back to like this, the idea of the ground zero, the bottom line, in order to be able to find new forms of inspiration that somehow includes everyone? Everything I have been interested in over the past 30 years, both as an architect and as a writer, has been about the endless, constant shift of meaning from one medium to another, from one culture to another, one discipline to another. <coughs> Difference matters not because it is different, but because different viewpoints, different histories, and different experiences of the world contribute in such rich, creative, and meaningful ways to scholarship and our shared understanding of what it means to be human. I want to be very clear on this point, that questions of identity, of race, of ancestry, and heritage matter because they add to scholarship, not detract from it. Difference, however it is constructed or conceived, enriches, matures, and it deepens us. Sometimes it replaces outdated, racist, misogynist, and irrelevant material. But I want to insist that the impetus for change must be one of generosity, not animosity. Being angry, as I say to students all the time, is only the first step in the long road to transform the academy and in the process transform ourselves. She is a friend of my mind. She gathered me back. The pieces I am, she gathered them and give them back to me in all the right order. I've thrown this book across the room. Like you read Tony and you cry, but you gotta lie. I say, yeah, yeah, you really got it. You got us all that time. She said, you know, if you don't understand the history of African-American women, you don't understand the history of America. First thing I had to do was to eliminate the white gaze, the little white man that sits on your shoulder. <laughs> so to knock him off. And you know, you're free. Now I own the world. I mean, I can write about anything. She took the canon of the written language and she broke it open. She's the Emancipation Proclamation of the English language. She reaches into the depths of pain and shows us all the ways we can come to love. That is what she does, with some words on a page. I love Toni Morrison, because she's not afraid to be black. It would be my job to publish the voices, the books, the ideas of African Americans. I don't know where this woman's energy came from to raise two kids, to bring other people of color to the party, and also write these novels. You have to be a little tough and rely on yourself. They don't want to give me the money because I'm a woman. And the men get more. 
Now, she urged us to imagine people who were slaves as human beings. We can never think about slavery in the same way. Morrison is a global figure. She's a global phenomenon. If there's life on Mars, they're reading Toni Morrison to find out what it is to be human. Fiction can sometimes represent social truths that are more searching, more questioning, and more truthful than facts will ever allow. I suppose I see architectural education as a kind of fiction in the best possible sense of the word, a means of exploring difficult and complex issues about who we are, who we have been, and who we want to be. The job of institutions, universities, independent schools, institutes, and yes, professional practices, is to protect the space in which those truths can be tried, tested, but above all, told. Thank you. So we will come here. We have mics. <laughs> We're mics up. So Leslie, thank you so much for coming here and for this amazing journey tonight. Um, I feel like your lecture was was both like part of your, you were showing us your personal journey, but then also, um, you know, theorizing at the same time, uh, showing us the path toward the African Futures Institute, but then also the path beyond it. Um, and I don't know, I just really appreciated the approach that you took, um, the way that it was personal. Um, but then at the same time, it made me think a lot. Well, you, you mentioned representation and the stakes of representation. And so just in your lecture, the forms of representation that you used, film, uh, performance, um, social commentary, uh, critique, um, there was something about, uh, to me, like a, a kind of questioning and presentation of a thinking through modes of representation toward new forms of representation, and they're not singular. Mm. So, um, you know, I thought a lot about abstraction um, because, especially in the section of the wake. Mm -hmm. the way that um, there were so many different types of media and uh, the body was brought in and uh, matter, material was brought in, uh, sound, these, these things in architecture that are perhaps somewhat peripheral mm -hmm. um, in pedagogy were brought in all on the same plane and it seemed to me that what you were presenting was perhaps a way of thinking through a kind of decolonized approach to representation, um, pedagogy and representation in, in the way that you were presenting. Um, and I, I don't know, I w wondered if you might comment yeah. on that. I remember, um, as quite a small child, <laughs> coming to the breakfast table one day, um, very anxious. And I'd been awake for some time and kind of overwhelmed by something. And my father said to me, like, you know, what, what's the matter with you? And I burst out, I'm trying to think beyond my imagination, but I can't. And for him, it was such a strange thing for an eight-year-old to be grappling with. But I think what I was trying to get at was that we are already contained by the languages we speak, by mm -hmm. the words we know, by the vocabulary that's around us. And if you want to try and imagine something beyond that, 
the difficulty of breaking out of what you already know is almost as hard as imagining the act of imagining itself. So there is something about the constant play between what you're confined by and the intuition you have that there may be something else out there, let's call it knowledge that's waiting to emerge, that I think architecture opened my eyes to that possibility of play. And I, I realize I'm speaking in a very roundabout way about, about it, but architecture never seemed to me to be didactic. It never seemed to me to be saying, this is the truth. What it seemed to be saying was, here are some tools. You can experiment with those tools. You can play with those tools in the most productive sense of the way. And you may be able to find something that is not immediately apparent in front of you. But if you know those tools well, whether they're language, representation, drawing, film, whatever it is, you can use those confidently to bring something that's not yet there into existence. And I guess I would say that that's been what our, that's the gift that architecture gave me, mm. that other disciplines, you know, I studied sociology before and, and languages, they never seem to provide that kind of power. So that, that is a very roundabout way of saying that, yes, the, the ability of architecture to take on board representations that are not simply plan, section and elevation, but are much, much more echo and sentiment and wonder and these things that we find quite hard. How would you represent those things? But they are part and parcel of the way we are in the world. And as a discipline, architecture just seems to me to be endlessly malleable in that it allows you to bring all of those things into its, into its heart, into its body. But there is a kind of tension, I think, in trying to bring all of that in. While the discipline is open, you know, you can find openings in it. At the same time, I think one has to be very um, uh, tactful and um, maybe conniving in a way. Um, and so what, what I kind of got from your talk was, was that sense, that sense of um, bringing the different media together and um, the power being in the overlay yeah. of the information and the gaps between it. Um, those gaps are, are powerful, um, but they're also, in a sense, um, I don't know, they, they kind of point toward new tools that we, so, you know, your small self saying that these new tools that, that we don't yet have uh, the words for or the, the kind of um, the techniques to actually um, express. But, you know, for, for me, I was really, I suppose, fortuitous in, in a way that I happened to, to study at the Bartlett during a very particular period of the Bartlett's existence. And the, the great gift, again, that, that that education gave me was the ability to not be afraid of the gaps. And that was a very particular curriculum setup. It was to do with really mundane things like the length of time that you could spend in a studio, the relationship between history and theory and peripheral subjects, let's say. The fact that there was no, we had no electives. Mm -hmm. Everything was taught within the same, I mean, you'd call it a studio, but it was really just a learning environment. We didn't have at the time the words to describe the various components of curricula that I, I later learned. So that's formative experience of being in a place that taught me to have courage, that, that actually provided the platform for courage, was something that I think I have tried to replicate in my teaching for 30 years mm -hmm. and couldn't do it within a, a traditional curriculum. So there is something about the relationship between the formal, um, I guess the formal education system and this desire to, to grapple with new concepts, new ways of being in the world, new relationships to the environment that I think is never, it hasn't yet been resolved. And, you know, we talked a little bit about this when, when I met students at lunchtime today, that, you know, the scale of an institute is, is, is also really an issue because the, the smaller something is, 
in some senses, the easier it is to control. And you can make that kind of freedom available. As institutions get larger and more complex, the bureaucracy required to, to maintain them inevitably starts to take over. So that tension for me is, is really around the issue of scale. But it seems to me that today with, with so many urgent questions that are not being answered by traditional forms of knowledge, the, the onus is on us to think of other ways to, to impart knowledge. And, and I, I don't exactly. have the answer for what that is yet. Yeah. Right. But I, 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 I kind of know it when I see it. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. yeah. So we've known each other for a long time, <laughs> 30 years, mm -hmm. um, and um, kind of you know, have grown not together, but like um, our paths have, have kind of moved at the same time, different circles, same circles. Um, but I don't know, like, I appreciated having a sense of your trajectory come through your talk. Mm -hmm. um, and it made me think about just, it made me think about the path uh, to get here. Um, well, how do I say this? It's very circuitous, that's all I can say. <laughs> well, I, I think for both of us, yeah. um, in some ways, we actually, we talked about this a little bit earlier, like this idea of moving laterally yeah. um, and not always, you know, kind of moving directly toward a target, but moving laterally and progressing, um, you know, so sort of moving around obstacles, um, but moving forward in that way. And I think that's something you know, that I, that I see in your path and somewhat in my own. No, for sure. And I think, you know, it's one of the amazing things about architecture is that it teaches you to literally to three-dimensionalize challenges. You know, you can figure out ways to go through something, you can go around it, you can go under it. You mean, it's an incredible map pathfinding way. So if I look back over the, you know, the last 30 years, there were times when the smartest thing to do in front of an obstacle was to was to go away, was to go sideways, to go somewhere else, and then kind of come back. So it, in some ways, it's been incredibly circuitous. But actually, architecture taught me not to be afraid of that. I think if I had not studied architecture, I might have had a much more um, tentative relationship to, to obstacles. So it, it, for me, it's the, it's the kind of conundrum. I spent 30 years being really critical of architecture, but at the same time, absolutely passionately invested mm -hmm. in it. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think that's the same of most architects. It's, there's something about this discipline that just doesn't let you go. Yeah. Mm. So I have to ask you about the Biennale before <laughs> I open it up to others. Um, you know, well, I'm, I'm really curious about just, um, you know, the, the framework, the laboratory of the future was one thing, but then you also had the special projects. Um, you know, and, and how you kind of compose that as well as the carnival, mm -hmm. which was an aspect of it. Your presentation of the wake mm -hmm. um, was very much to me um, related to this idea of the carnival and this kind of wake that went through the Biennale and sort of supercharged it mm -hmm. um, with uh, counter talks and performances and films, um, counter narratives. Um, so if you would just talk to that a little bit. Yeah, I mean, I think um, Dean Sarkis will know this. You know, when they, when they sort of say to you, you know, we would like you to curate this, um, they're very clever. And then they say, and we'd also like you to do a, an event program. And you say, yes, yeah, I'll do that. And we'd also like you to do a college. Yeah, I'll do that. And so they keep on, well, they're certainly with me, they just kept on saying, we'd like you to do this. And I kept saying, yes, yes, I'll do that, but had no idea you're like what were going to be the resources you know required to to make this happen but once you'd said you were going to do it i mean you kind of have no choice you have to do it and the the decision to 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 put the laboratory of the future together actually was something that had you know it came from many many years before i think i always knew that that was the story i wanted to tell what i wasn't prepared for and i think this must be the same for every curator 
is actually physically how you make it happen. You have no experience of it. Like I, I had no idea how to curate a show. And I think this is probably different for the art biennale where the curators generally are professional curators. And that's what I meant when I said that, you know, it really is the fault line between the personal story that you want to tell and the kind of public experience of that. Having done it, I would never, ever do it again. But I, I imagine that most curators would say the same thing. Um, and there were moments where I literally thought I was going to die from overwork. Mm -hmm. um, it was such an undertaking. But I think also everybody who participated knew that um, the opportunity to tell this story wouldn't come around again soon. So the participants came to the party with such energy yeah. that, um, you mean yourself included, that it was, you know, that kind of fed the whole team. And, and I have to say that the quality of, of work you know, I, I put out the call and then I asked people to respond and then there was, you know, it, I gave some feedback and then it went back and then it came back. The quality of the work that came in that first step just blew me away. There were some projects where I just sort of said, yeah, off you go. Like, I literally haven't got anything to say about it. It's, it's fantastic. So that was a real surprise to me. I um, mean, it, it kind of showed me as well that people had been waiting for this moment to say something. Mm -hmm. um, so... You know, there was the logistics and getting the money and the funding in place, and that's the kind of stuff that's sort of back of house. But the actual stories, the objects, the, the projects were already there. As a participant, it was pretty amazing um, being in a context to see yourself reflected. Um, and also the way that you organized the show where there were different generations of um, you know architects and thinkers so um, students people from all over the world um, it was just really really interesting to see different mm -hmm. reflections of oneself um, different perspectives but still this kind of relation um, and way of communicating yeah, and I mean, I, I come from the world's youngest continent. I mean, Africa is simultaneously the world's oldest continent and its youngest, but the average age is, you know, it's under 20. And so there is this kind of youthfulness about where I live that you cannot help but be, I want to say on the one hand, part of it, but also carried by it. Mm. So when I knew, okay, you know, 50% of this show was going to be about Africa, that 50% were going to be largely people under the age of, you know, 30. And that, um, that demographic and that dynamic also characterized the fearlessness of what many people came with. Mm -hmm. So when I talked about these, this cohort being guests from the future, actually, I really meant it. The, and for me, it was a little bit strange because, you know, the term guest also implies that you are there, you know, on someone else's invitation. But I also felt very strongly that these guests are going to go on to become hosts of the future. And so to have that experience of, um, you know, a show on that scale was really important to me. But photo in the audience who was there, there were people, it was, it was, it was great, yeah. So this is a good time to open questions up to the audience. Are there any questions? I feel like you know we're having a fireside chat, but <laughs> <laughs> there's no fire, there's no whiskey. <laughs> One of the guests from the future. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Leslie. Thank you, Yolande. Um, yeah, this is really beautiful. Um, if the Biennale were to happen on the continent, what would be different? Hmm. That's a great question. I mean, the, the back of house stuff that the public, I suppose, don't see is equal to the show. And it's the back of house stuff that we don't have the infrastructure for yet. I think if the Biennale were to happen on the continent, it would probably take a very different form. So it might not wind up being a static exhibition. I think there are many ways that it could play out. And for me, I'm really excited to see 
what will come out in the next sort of five, ten years. Because I think that the, the relationship between the continent and its diaspora, is, it, particularly in architecture circles, is enormous. And the opportunity that people now have to kind of connect and work and, and work together mm -hmm. across things like distance and time, which you know, 10 or 15 years ago would have been much harder to do. I think in some ways the pandemic also played into um, our ability to work remotely on this project so that I could talk to someone in Kinshasa in the same way I was talking to someone in Cairo as the same way I was talking to somebody in, in Venice. So I think you know, the, the, the exhibition of the future will, will have a very different form. And I mean, we all know my, my visa troubles just getting people to come to Venice. I think one of the reasons why the African Futures Institute is now starting with this nomadic African studio program is that for the majority of you know, Africans, we don't need visas to go you know, intra-Africa. So to, to sort of set some of these precedents on a slightly different trajectory, I think has also been a really key byproduct of the Biennale to think about things like mobility and access differently. But over to you, curator of the future. Are there any other questions? I kind of have a question that maybe can be addressed to both of you and Leslie, since you both curated such a big um, exhibition. Um, first of all, thank you for exposing us to voices that I don't think I would have come across unless I had gone and experienced the Biennale. Um, my question to you is, how do you get such a far reach? I, I'm always amazed by the extent of such an exhibition, and, and I wonder to what extent is it your personal network and the people that you know and trust, and how does it extend beyond that? How do you, how do you build that trust and reach people that, um, I mean, you don't want to make it biased, right? How do you deal with that? Mm. It's a great question. I mean. You know, part of it, yes, is to do with personal networks. And when you take on a project at that scale, I think you, you do have to have some people around you that you trust. And working with people remotely, I found that if I knew people beforehand, actually, it wasn't so difficult to build on that relationship remotely. If I didn't know them beforehand, it was quite hard to build that up you know, through Zoom. So I had to be quite strategic about having some people on, on board who I trusted. But we did a project with the, the young researchers at the African Futures Institute called the Pinpoint Directory. And they essentially scanned the globe for upcoming talent. And they went everywhere through Instagram, through WhatsApp messages, through personal networks, through people's Rolodexes, <laughs> through word of mouth. It was quite, kind of an exhaustive process. But in the end, we pulled together something like 500 names. And then it was just down to me, kind of really me just sifting through those 500 and saying, OK, that sounds like it would fit. I haven't got anybody from that part of the world. You know, it was, it was that kind. And for all the people that were included, there was you know, three times the people who were not, um, which is also a consideration. But the pinpoint directory is, as a thing itself is for me, is, is a phenomenal piece of work because it, it really was like a detective. I've heard of somebody in Lumumbashi doing something really interesting with somebody in Kigali or whatever. Go off and find that person. Yeah. Um, do you plan to make that public? We do. Um, you know, one of the, the conundrums for the African Futures Institute is that, that people often use us as a resource. So people who are looking for you know, people to be on lecture circuits, to be on juries, to be on XYZ, the first port of call if they're looking for someone in Africa is they come, you know, they come to me. But you know, the resources required to keep those things up to date and to, it's it's tough. But at the same time, you don't want to not make the platform available. So we're trying to work out how to do this, I guess, sustainably, because otherwise, all you do is become a resource for everybody else. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. This was incredible. You talked about generosity versus animosity. I, I think that's such a powerful statement. You are so generous yourself. Um, and I think there's a lot of love behind that generosity that allows you to be that generous. And you talked about 
the demography of the geography. And when you opened up, did you, you had a lot of applications, uh, a lot of projects you had to see through and pick. Did you feel the generosity of that geography coming back? And am I, that generosity, did it come with love? Because I think that you have to really love to understand a subject and get into it and get naked and share. Um, did, 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 you, did you feel it? You, you had a lot of hard work. You, would, you said you would never do it again. Um, but I think you unlocked incredible power. And I, I wonder if you felt that or you feel it or do, does it come back to you? It's a really good question. I mean, I think there is this um, constant negotiation that, that happens when you, when you offer something that, you, that you, you, cannot give of, you can't give yourself over to it completely because you also need to conserve resources and energy for yourself. If you are putting something together like this, like, like a show of this scale, there will be moments in the two-year process where you have to make really tough decisions, where you have to, you have to kind of be prepared to, to be with your back against the wall. I found very quickly that if I gave everything to the process, I wouldn't have those reserves available to me when I had to make really tough decisions. And I think that that, um, aspect of leadership is very rarely talked about, particularly for women. And I would say particularly for women of color. So for me, the moments in the, in the two year process that were the most difficult were moments where the public perception of the resources that women of color have to give to others was completely at odds with the resources that I had. And those moments were very tense and actually very, very painful. That's partly why I say I wouldn't do it again, because it, it I mean, I, I, I kind of joke, this thing took my lifeblood and it did. But I also think that that's part and parcel of putting on something like this, with this demographic, with these histories, with these experiences, that in some ways you, you have to give over a part of yourself and not just of me personally, but actually other people in the team, that there is a certain amount of sacrifice that, that has to take place in order for something to happen. So on the one hand, it is quite easy to say, act out of generosity, not animosity, but I know it will take me personally the next five, 10 years to work through the levels of animosity that I had towards the process. I think where you, where I received much more than I ever anticipated was from the participants. And so their generosity in terms of giving of themselves to, to this project was the, the kind of lifeblood that I, I took back. And that's a very, yeah, yeah, yeah. I did, yeah, yeah. Not so much from the the organization of it, but actually from the participants, yeah. No, not, not necessarily from the participants, but I think, I mean, from the visitors, because actually the visitors were, were kind of amazing. And there's a woman, um, Anna Abengoe, who is, um, she's a deputy head of the school in Johannesburg, who, you know, she's roughly the same height as me, she's got curly hair. The number of photographs of selfies that Anna took with people in that week of the opening who just came up to her and said, can I have a selfie with you? <laughs> and she just said, look, I just gave up explaining I'm not her. <laughs> and so there are these photographs, you know, in albums or whatever, on phones around the world of somebody else completely. But, but the public's um, love for the show was, was actually phenomenal. Um, and, and that aspect, although, yes, it was tiring, particularly in that vernissage week of the opening, was, was really amazing. People just coming up to you, random people on Vaporetti and in the streets of Venice. That was, that was very special. Thank you. 
you knew before you started in order to prepare better? It's a great question. I mean, I think um, it, again, it's a bit like the relationship between the front of house and the back of house. If I had known more about what the back of house of a school of architecture was going to be, I might not have done it. But I suspect that, that that's the same for all, almost every new project. Having done it twice now, it's sort of setting up schools, it's always the same thing that for me kills the project, which is the administration. And the administration of of a school is, is its own thing. You know, when, when, when someone says, you know, do you want to be the head of a school? I think people often forget that leadership is its own job. You know, it, it, it's, it's not something you do on the side. That is the job. But having to understand finance, human resources, legalities, building, I mean, there's a huge amount that goes into starting up something from scratch. And without the right team members to take on those roles, actually, it's really, really difficult. Um, and I would say, you know, to go back to the, to the question about generosity, you know, at a certain point, the, the task of trying to hold it together, I think, is, is not worth the, the end result. So it, it forces you to, I mean, it certainly forced me to think a, a bit more adaptively about, you know, what does education mean? Does it have to be a bricks and mortar institute? Does it have to be a fixed location? I think if the path had been smoother, I might not have had those questions. Yeah. And I, I still think, for me personally, nothing beats teaching. I, I, I love teaching. The administration, not so much. But I suspect that that's the same for, for everyone. Yeah. Yeah. So the iteration of the Africa Futures Institute now is more nomadic, it you is. said. Yeah. And it's nomadic, but it's on the continent. Yeah, so we, we now have funding um, for two years, and then, then there's more sort of in the pipeline. So twice a year for four and a half weeks, we will send out an open call, and it's fully funded. Um, it's between 24 and 30 places for graduate students, early career academics, and early career practitioners to come to a, a location on the continent. And we have, this, we have six core faculty, and the first <coughs> studio will be in Morocco in January 2025, and the topic is Maghreb, which is it's a, a new kind of a, a form of identity that goes beyond the nation state. So the project will be something about what are the formal or the spatial implications of that form of, of national identity. And I think you know the, the beauty of having this twice a year program is that there's no validation, there's no accreditation, there's, there's I mean, we might put a certificate together, but actually you come for the experience of it. And that the people who take part in it, I think, will eventually go back into their home locations and, and do very different things. And for me, if I spent the next five years doing that, I'd, I'd be super happy. And yes, you know, at the moment, it's on the African continent, but we're also really interested in this idea of Africa being a, a wider thing than its geography. So if we think about you know, things like the Black Atlantic, the Caribbean, the Americas, like there's, there's, a, there's a, a wider territory at play here. So I, it, I think, the, for me, the, the structure of it seems to fit what we're trying to do. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I think, yeah, it, it'll be interesting. Yeah. It so. also seems like it's a malleable enough framework that, like, I know you're, you're sort of um, approaching retirement. resting mode. No, no. <laughs> That's what I really am. <laughs> I'm easing towards retirement. No. <laughs> resting mode <laughs> while you reset <laughs> but it seems like um you know i don't know it seems like stepping back um is a way to recalibrate you know yeah. how to yeah. move forward with the project yeah and i mean i think um you know the experience at the in johannesburg and even the experience you know um at, in, in accra Setting up the frameworks for students, you know, whether they are actual students or they're practitioners or, 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 or academics, to experiment 
thoughtfully and intelligently and creatively with some of these concepts. That I know how to do. So I've spent so long trying to bash my way into institutions to allow me to do that. And I think actually, no, now forget that. If, if it can't work in a formal institution, find another way for it to happen. And that's sort of where, not just me, but you know, the, the six faculty who, who are on board, that's kind of how we all think. Mm -hmm. And there is a kind of urgency about it. You know, the time is now. Let's do it now um, and, and see what happens. So look out for the open call. Mm -hmm. okay. If there aren't any other questions, that's a good place to end. Look for the open call. Yep. <laughs> I'm the uh, official closer, but <laughs> very briefly. I, I would just say um, thank you, uh, Yolande. I don't know that there's anyone else that Leslie would have crossed the Atlantic for. <laughs> and so <laughs> if we yeah, can, okay. you know, um, uh, uh, we're in your debt. And of course, Leslie, we're in your debt. I have to say my, uh, the combination of respect and joy um, uh, that I felt at the Biennale itself is only mirrored by the feeling in the room tonight. So I'm just so um, enormously glad that we got to spend this time together. Um, I would say officially that uh, we have another lecture on Thursday. <laughs> um, Matthias Schuller from Transolo, very different 